Good evening, folks. Lisa Ziegler here, coming to you from my little urban flower farm with our weekly home garden tutorial tonight. And um, couldn't just be a, a nicer evening out here. It's a little steamy, but it's kind of cloudy, so that makes for um, good videoing. And I have a lot to share with you today. And we finally have a few flowers in our little cutting garden, right? So just to kind of um, bring everybody up to speed that may be joining us for the very first time. So I'm a commercial cut flower farmer, been doing it for 23 years. I um, you know, teach and do courses and written a couple of books and um, it all started literally with this little cutting garden many years ago. And so what we're here learning is how this little three by 10 cutting garden can produce one to two handfuls of flowers a week once it gets up and running. And when you plant the right varieties and follow a few steps setting it up and then cut it and take care of it y'all like a cutting garden, not a landscape. That's the real secret. And because of that care, Planting a much smaller garden is so much smarter because it literally would take me two to four minutes to do the maintenance and cut this little garden every week if this is all I had to do. And when it's that simple, people really do it, but it's when it gets, when people say three by 10 shucks, I need a bigger garden than that. Um, because they don't realize how much it's going to produce when you follow some flower farming rules. Um, and they overplant and then they don't do that necessary step for a cutting garden and that is to cut it every single week. Whether you need flowers or not. And just like we have more basil to cut tonight than someone would probably typically need, um, you cut it and you either compost it or you put it on your kitchen table. Um, because by cutting it, you get the new crop to come on, new sprouts to grow and keep the garden fresh and clean and, and producing. So before we get over there in the garden, because I have several things to show you, and the deer ate another sunflower, y'all. It's so funny that they've only eaten two out of, I think there's like 12 or 13 of them planted here. So funny. Anyway, I met them. Actually, Tucker and I met them last night. It's a mom and a dad and two babies. And, you know, I don't mind them eating a little bit here and a little there, but of all the gar the flowers on this farm, they had to eat from the display garden, right? I mean, oh my gosh, we have thousands of sunflowers planted in other areas that they haven't touched. So I see a bee is zooming around me. So before I get up um, and take a look at that, I want to share a couple of things. So first off, for those of you that are just joining us for the very first time, um, if you like and share this broadcast, it really helps me the most. That allows Facebook to show our stuff to more people, and um, that way we get more followers and just it just builds everything up, and we really appreciate it when you do. Um, to find anything that I mentioned today, you can go to our website, thegardenersworkshop.com, find the tools, the seeds, the supplies, courses to learn how to have a little cutting garden, to seed starting, to cool flowers, and I also teach big um, school courses to budding flower farmers. So <clears throat> you can find it all. If you place an order with us, this is our beautiful catalog. Um, which we put in all of our order boxes, as well as our gardener's workshop pins. And <clears throat> we'd love to send you one. And um, we put those in all orders as long as supplies last, and they come and go. Um, and the two things that I wanted to, to show before I start um, cutting here, this is the cutting garden that we're working from. This has six packs of seeds, and if you live, um, my first frost date is typically mid-November. Um, you can plant this little garden about up to like three and a half months before your last frost, your first frost date, sorry. Um, so you still have time because we are still planting more zinnias, more coxcomb, um, and so it's really possible. 
Um, so all the seeds are in here. They can be direct seeded or they can be started indoors. We start everything indoors because as you're gonna see, the sunflower seeds that we planted together over here in this little garden never sprouted. Um, it's just a little bit more. There's a reason commercial growers typically do not direct seed unless they absolutely have to. And it's because it's more difficult and labor intensive to get the seeds up and to get seedlings and to get them thinned and to keep the weed pressure down versus just sticking um, a transplant in the ground, which you feel fairly certain is going to survive. Um, so you can find this on our website. And I wanna just talk about zinnias for a couple of minutes also. So I did go over, I did not cut these from our little garden because you know, our little garden is about a month behind our big commercial garden. Um, and that was because we had such a long, cold um, tip a time. I guess we planted this little garden at least three or four weeks after our big garden because our big garden was uh, our commercial garden was hooped and covered and so um, I wanted I had to just run over there before I came on and cut these beautiful zinnias from our big garden y'all look at this look how big this zinnia is it's almost as big as my face um, I had to go over and cut these to show you guys. This is what's coming in this garden. The ones we have in here aren't this developed and far along, and I absolutely just wanted you guys to be able to see them. Um, the salmon is just, there it is, is just absolutely gorgeous. Um, but I wanna talk about zinnias for a minute because in addition to having the strongest pest pressure, that we've had in years. I mean, the Japanese beetles, um, they may eat Steve and I tonight. <laughs> There's enough of them. Um, and in addition to that, diseases. So we've had a very wet, moist spring and early summer, as well as it's been cooler, um, cool nights. I mean, I actually had a jacket on um, in early June cutting flowers one morning. I mean, that's unheard of. Usually we're hot and steamy. Well, we have had mildew on our zinnias even before I cut the first one. And this is months earlier than it normally is, but the conditions were have just really been great for mildew and not so great for everything else. Um, and so I want to just talk a little bit about, first off, this is the reminder. Again, I know y'all are about tired of hearing me say this, but this is the perfect example of why you must succession plant. Succession plants is, instead of planting your entire designated area one time with your garden plants, with whether it's zinnias or a cutting garden or whatever, you're better to divide it up into seconds or thirds and um, plant part today, part in three or four weeks, and then the other part in three or four weeks. And we fortunately already have more zinnias that have been in the ground. And so um, we may mow these zinnias. I mean, they are gorgeous, y'all. They are really, really gorgeous. But if I can't get the mildew under control and I do not do any treatment, we do it by cutting the plants really hard and getting rid of the fault, getting rid of the, what I cut. Um, and letting the plants regrow. Do not fertilize because that fuels mildew because it's of the sugars, the food that's in there will actually fuel the um, spores. So we also have some bacteria spots. I mean, you could do a study on Xenia diseases this year in our patch, which happens some years. And I wanted to show you, um, these are the little chlorine pills that we always, we put them in all of our harvest buckets. Um, for every flower that we harvest on our farm. And you can go to our website and read more about this. I'm not gonna talk in depth about it. Um, the chlorine pills, they're called CVCVBN. And you'll find them under supplies on our website. There's 50 tablets in here. I think this is 20 bucks or something. And we put one tablet in a gallon of water and harvest into it, and then the flowers sit in there for at least four hours, but they can sit in it for up to three days. It fills your stem with bacteria-free water and really adds to your vase life. And on years like this, where disease is high 
and stress is high. I mean, those zinnias were so stressed because of the cold conditions. Um, you know, it's just no wonder they have fallen victim to diseases, right? So um, these are the tablets that we put in all of our harvest buckets that really do make a really big difference. Sorry, y'all, my nose is itching. So um, that's what we put in our water. And then um, once, they, once the, the flowers are made into a bouquet and then put into a vase, that's when we put regular flower food in, which continues the bacteria killing, but it also, sorry y'all, I'm really got a nose itch. Couldn't be these flowers right here, right? Might, might, might be, I need to get away from them. Um, so then your flower food continues that. So I promised you guys that I was gonna tell you about some one of my Japanese beetle strategies, or actually two of them. And I'll tell you, I do it every morning now. I walk around, we have Japanese beetles, as I said earlier, they might eat Steve and I tonight. There's so many of them. If, we're, if we show up missing, you know what happened. Um, I mean, it's just crazy how many Japanese beetles we have on this farm. T in a typical year, we have two or three little pockets in a zinnia patch somewhere that I just smash them with my gloved hand, um, with gloves on my hand, and no big deal. Now, we have many patches, and there's many of them. Sometimes there's 10 or 15 of them clustered together. And I don't have a um, Japanese beetle right here to show you, but I thought this would be a great place. I just walk around with this really convenient, this is just a plastic pitcher, and this is just water with some dishwashing liquid in it. The dishwashing liquid, liquid kind of coats them so they can't crawl out while they're dying. Um, and, oh gosh, I'm sorry, rubbing my nose on TV. Um, so, the way that I would do it, let's just say that there was Japanese beetles right here on this flower. I just simply, when I'm walking, I walk up and just put my container under it and just tap the flower or tap the foliage. You get really good at it after a little while. Um, and that way you don't even have to touch them and it drops them in the water. And in fact, it does kill them. They ultimately drown and I actually caught several squash bugs this morning also and did the very same thing with them. Any undesirable, but you need to make sure it's an undesirable before you start drowning them, right? So um, I just walk around and um, you can flush them. My husband, the plumber, said that's perfectly acceptable to do that. They're a biodegradable product and um, we just flush them. By doing that every morning, I have already drastically decreased our population. But what you have to remember is every one you kill, and I have not looked it up, I have to ask Rhonda if she knows, how many offspring you prevent from being on your property next year by eliminating one adult. Um, so that's what I think of. I think of how many I'm preventing from happening next year every time I do this. So that's what you do. You just put your container up under where they are and tap it. And what you will find after you've done that a few times is that these boogers are smart y'all I mean it is really very fascinating to me that especially when I'm in the pathways that we have that have um, leaves in them so they can hear you crunching and coming after you've done this for several days in a row when they hear you coming before you're even close to them they start dropping see that's what happens that's why you put it under the flower when they feel threatened they just fall and you want them to fall into your pitcher. Sometimes if they're hard, I mean, our beds are pretty wide. If I see one that's kind of just sitting on top of a flower, it particularly annoys me. When I find them sitting on top of a big gorgeous zinnia or flower, sunning themselves, sometimes those little boogers, I just snatch them up with my hand and, and throw them in the water. Um, but I just don't want you to get discouraged because it does make a really big difference. And here's the other thing, and you're gonna see when I cut this garden, we're gonna cut here in a minute, you're gonna see the damage that they do. And we have a lot of damage out in our um, field. And what's gonna happen this week, now that our enrollment is over for flower farming school courses that just was on last week, I mean, we were just so overloaded here. Um, there was no time for me to spend hours in the field just cutting and trashing flowers. Um, but that's what's gonna happen here this week. 
because when you cut, like we're gonna cut this morning, your plant literally regrows. That's what annuals do, right? And um, I think I see, oh, that's a bee. I was gonna say, maybe I can go over here. We'll look at these sunflowers before I cut them um, to see if we can capture any Japanese beetles. But don't be discouraged by the state of your plants. I literally, out in that field, am gonna cut many of those um, zinnias that really look tough. They have mildew, they have some spots, they're eaten up with Japanese beetle. I'm gonna cut them and leave a stump out of the ground this big. I mean, they're full grown, they look like this. I'm gonna cut them down to this big, because what's gonna happen? Sprouts are gonna come from right there. And why not, right? I mean, they're so damaged, and so, what happens is sometimes you just have to suffer through really bad weather times, like we just did rain and rain and rain, that just fueled this whole problem to start. And it's not gonna get rid of it 100%, but it's gonna make it tolerable, I'm hoping, and have had that experience in the past. You never ever know, and it depends. Like right now, we're all of a sudden dry now, and, um, the next, the forecast for the next week is not just um, loaded with rain every day. I mean, we've gone through weeks where it's just been 80, 80%, 80%, 80%. So, um, you know, these guys are worth working for. And I'm not gonna answer your questions right now. I will come back and go through them, but I did notice the question a minute ago, somebody was asking what type are these? These are Benary's Giants. You can find all the seeds on our um, website, thegardenersworkshop.com. We sell them by solid colors and by the mixes, and they are scrumptious. They are the most commercially grown zinnia in the world. Um, they're from Germany and they are the, the most mildew resistant and the most prolific. And as I showed you, the biggest, most gorgeous double blooms. And by the way, they all, that's the perfect time to cut a zinnia. See how developed they are when you look at them from the side. And the ones you're gonna see over here just aren't really even near this because they just aren't ready. Most of them aren't ready to cut. We're gonna leave them, but I've got a few because I wanna show you where to make the cut. And I'm gonna figure out how I'm gonna show you that how to do it and hold the camera all at the same time. So let me just gather my stuff here. And I'm also, we are going to cut this, I think I'm gonna cut the sunflowers first and get them out of the way. I'm gonna show you what to do to your sunflowers. And then I have some new sunflowers to pluck in where we um, cut them out. So let's, um, I think what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to hold the camera and make the cuts, and then I'll just lay them all down, and then I'll put the camera back on the pod, tripod, and then I'll strip them and show you guys the next process. So this is not typically how I do it, but this is how we're doing it today when I do not have a camera person here. And I have to tell you guys, so this is the first week since the COVID um, virus broke out that I have not been forced to cut flowers on Sunday. Um, because of trying to socially distance our work um, and workers, um, I've been cutting on Sunday mornings early so that the bouquet maker could come on Sunday night. Um, but now we were able to get back to normal and I did not have to cut flowers today. Today was just a lovely day. It's my first full day of rest that I have had in a really long time. Um, so, all right, so I'm gonna take you off of here. And first thing I gotta turn you around. Oh, I gotta take my glove off. Y'all stand by. I'm gonna, y'all can look up at the sky for just a minute, right? All right, stand by. Look at the grass for a minute, y'all. Sorry, I gotta put my glove back on. I don't do anything without my gloves on, y'all, because um, I always tell folks, um, you don't realize how much it damages your hands, but in matter, in, in addition to that, your hands get so filthy when you're stripping flowers, like I strip all the time, and you just don't realize how dirty your hands are till you get around a bunch of clean people. All right, so I'm going to take our little harvester full of our little zinnias. I mean, is that just, let me just show you that little sight. Is that just not the best looking 
little family of zinnias you've ever seen. And I'll tell you why the sunflower, why I stripped some of my sunflowers. All right, so let's just put this here. So let's take a look. First off, um, so now we have two sunflowers that have been snipped off by the deer, goners. And the rest of these actually should have already been cut. But I, I left them here to show you guys. Um, this is what happens when you leave them. See the damage? There's little holes in the petals there. That's because these were, I left these out here so we could cut them together. And of course I have a bazillion other sunflowers so I didn't have to really worry about it. They're usable and looky there. There is a Japanese beetle. I'll get his butt in a minute. All right, so let's look, I want, you, I want to show you the right stage to cut. This, in fact, is the proper stage to cut. See how the petals have just begun to lift? And they will quickly open um, indoors, safe from pests. Um, and people really, really um, are reluctant to do it. But I'm telling you, we cut thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of these. And they will open. So what I'm going to do, so these sunflowers that are in the seed collection are pro cuts. Pro cuts are single bloom stems, you can see. Now, the reason that I pulled some of these sunflowers off that you can see down here is to make room. See how this flower right here is really kind of suffering, the zinnia? And it's because he was hidden under a lot of these sunflower um, leaves. And in fact, you can even take off more. So while your sunflowers are growing up, you can strip many of those sunflowers down low because they're growing in such a compact area here, right? Um, so it's really, um, um, and see this over here really could have, see how that big beautiful leaf is just really shading those guys underneath? So that is perfectly okay. I would strip all of these. Let me just do it even though we're getting ready to cut the sunflower down. So, I am literally, let me look at this one last sunflower. Let's see if this guy is ready. Now see this guy, I might leave for another day. See how you can't really see the petals? See how you can see the petals on that? That's cuttable. This probably could wait another day or two. So I'm actually gonna cut all of these sunflowers and the sunflowers, it does not matter where you make the cut because it's a single bloom stem, right? So I think I'm actually gonna cut the zinnias and the lemon basil first because I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to put you back on the tripod to, to do the sunflowers. So let's take a look. So we're gonna cut, this is a lime green zinnia. I always cut lime green zinnias much earlier than um, any other zinnia because they quickly get dirty in the center. And if you leave it, actually, I would, if this was being cut for uh, to be sold, this would not be sold because it's already got a little brown right there. It should have been cut several days ago. So let's have a look at this plant. So here's the stem with the bloom and we're gonna follow it down. Look at all these branches, right? And down here, I am gonna make the cut. So here we are at ground level, right, right here. So there's one, two, we have to get rid of that leaf. Let's get rid of a couple of these leaves so we can really see what we're doing here, right? All right, <clears throat> so see the skeleton here? So you have one, two, three, four, and there's five back there. I'm gonna make my first cut, everybody hold their breath, right here, right above those five bottom side shoots. The first cut is so important, y'all. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna lay him over and we're gonna strip him and get to him in just a minute here. This red one that's right here, I could cut also. And I'm gonna do the very same thing, I'm gonna cut right above about five bottom shoots. And see, these are netted. You can't hardly see the netting because it's green. And this first cut, I typically pull it down through the bottom of the netting instead of trying to pull it up. So let's just cut all the zinnias that are ready. And then we're gonna strip all these together and then we're gonna cut some basil. 
really I'm not <clears throat> so this is a, this isn't a really impressive yellow one but yellow is just like the lime green they get dirty really really fast pests um, spots get on them quickly so I'm gonna cut this one too so let's see <clears throat> let's remove some of this foliage So there's one, there's another one on the back side, two. So I'm gonna cut this one right here and we'll take a look at what's left. So can you see, it's about six inches from ground level. Look at all this nut grass I have to pull. And um, look at all these side shoots that are gonna be growing up and blooming in no time. All right, so let's just, Pile, and this is, you know, this is only because you guys, because I can't hold the camera and strip flowers at the same time. Normally, I cut and strip, cut and strip and hold them in my hands. Um, and I'm going to do that for you in just a minute, but we need to get our stuff cut so I can put this back in the tripod. So this is the lemon basil, and this is the stage I love to cut it in, y'all, right when the spike is developed, but there's no blooms yet, right? And this is exactly the same recipe for cutting. Look down there. Look at all these side shoots. And I am just gonna reach down in there and cut that baby. And I'm pulling him through the netting instead of up through the top. And this over here needs to be cut even more. And if you let the, see how many there are? They really should all be cut, y'all. And you just need to find something to do with it because if you leave them on here, the stems are going to start to get woody and they don't hydrate as well. And by cutting, oh my gosh, this one is so branchy. You're not going to believe this. So I'm pulling it down through the netting. And look, that plant now has one, two, three, four, five, six more side shoots that are gonna go on and grow up now, right? And then I wanna show, this is the Japanese beetle damage. And we're gonna cut all this and I'm just, I'm not stripping this because this is gonna be trashed. But if we want new wonderful foliage to grow, so that's a trasher. And here is another good one. Sorry, y'all, I know you can't see very good, but I'm doing the very same thing I just, just did. However, this one's kind of trapped in the netting. See the netting? Oh, let me get where you can see. See the netting here? And sometimes I just have to risk manipulating it. So there's one good flower, so we'll strip him. All right, and we're gonna cut this, these are Oklahomas. These are the little teeny zinnias, which also happen to be my favorites. I know you can't see very good. All right, gang. So, I am going to set us up here. So, there's my harvester that has water with the conditioner in it. And... We'll bring these babies over. This would never be the situation, <laughs> the way that we do it. So let me get the tripod and let's figure this out, gang. Appreciate y'all's um, patience with me. One of the reasons that I can do this is because I don't have staff here helping me. You know what I mean? It just means that we can really do it. And you can find all of our, the supplies, the seeds, the clippers that I'm using, um, the pouch that I use and all the seeds um, on our website, thegardenersworkshop.com. So let's, let me turn this around so you can see me. All right. So, now I'm going to show you how I strip. So, this is the lemon basil, right? 
and you strip a lot more than you think. All those, and yes, you could use those side shoots if you so needed them, but they're too short for me. Um, I literally, I take off any foliage that's not gonna be showing in a bouquet because every piece of foliage that you remove adds vase life. So this is basically all that's left from that big honking piece of basil. But this will hold up for 10 days in um, a vase. Now, here's some of that Japanese, that's what Japanese beetle damage looks like. And this is kind of a funky zinnia. Looky there, it's got two stems with blooms. So I'm just gonna kind of use my clippers and treat them as two separate stems. And I strip everything off for zinnias. I leave no foliage on zinnia stems. Not only is this, the foliage typically not very pretty, um, but it too sucks the life out of the stem and we use other stuff for foliage. The foliage is usually in a spot that it doesn't really contribute to um, the bouquet. So here's another one. And these central stem cuts sometimes have really thick side shoots. So sometimes, I mean, I'm just using my hand gloved. If you don't have gloves, your hands will be a mess when you're finished doing this. So sometimes I'm afraid that I might break the stem by just stripping like I just did like that. So sometimes I clip them off, it just really depends. So literally, that's all that's left. And so look at this yellow and look how long that booger is. And even though I don't need it that long, I have to cut it where the plant needs me to cut it, not where for the stem length that I need. Because when you cut it, you are establishing this first cut you are establishing the branching of this annual plant and they will, um, sorry y'all, when I'm using the clippers, I have to look at what I'm doing or I'll cut my finger off. Um, you're establishing the branching, branching for the entire season. So here's another basil. And I will tell you that, so you see all these side branches, all this stuff. Yes, it could be used for culinary use, but we, I mean, that's not what I'm growing it for. So we just strip it all off and it's quite a very wonderful fragrance. And I would take these two off and that's what is left to go in my bouquet. And that is really the perfect stage to cut in. All right, now here's one more zinnia and then we're gonna go do our sunflowers. So these are pretty heavy side shoots. So I'm just gonna cut them instead of stripping them. And there you go. All right, so let's see what I'm gonna do about these sunflowers here. So I am going to, um, let's see what you can see. You can't really see down low. So what I am gonna do is I am going to reach down here and make the cut for these sunflowers all the way at ground level because these are done and you wanna get them out of the way because we're gonna plug in some new sunflowers to start growing um, to have later. And so this sunflower, of course, had its head eaten by a deer, so he's history. But this guy, I'm actually gonna make the cut for them. This is about how long I like sunflowers to be for us here commercially. And as I showed you a few minutes ago, um, this is really too late. You can already see there's a little bit of bug damage. And um, this is how I like to leave my sunflowers. We leave one leaf. This is the leaf because, let me get my harvester, y'all. <clears throat> and this little flower caddy you will also find on our um, website, Woman Owned Business, made in the USA in California. Um, and this is the length and actually that's a little long. You can cut it to any length you want. Um, I have the most beautiful bunch of white and yellow or orange sunflowers on my kitchen bar right now, them mixed together. That is just really fabulous. So I'm going to quickly just go through here. This is how I cut. Oh, in fact, this is not true. Let me show you the real way we cut them just occurred to me. I'm over here doing something totally different. And if the top leaf is looking like this, cut that booger off. You don't need him. 
Um, so this is actually how we strip sunflowers here on the farm, um, out in the field. We strip them before we cut them. It just makes it so much easier. So I go through, oh, there's that Japanese beetle. Y'all gonna see me a murder live. He's a goner. So I've stripped them. And then I just go through, you know, when you're cutting 500 of these at a time, that step in itself, oh, there's another Japanese beetle. I mean, I don't miss killing any of them because again, I remember for every one that I remove is less for next year. So now what I'm gonna do to prepare my spot to plant more sunflowers is I'm just cutting down at ground level and getting rid of these stakes, these old thick stalks. I mean, this obviously is not what we do in our big commercial garden, but in your little cutting garden, this is the perfect way to do this. So, let me cut these other sunflowers, y'all. If I don't cut them, they'll just be left out here till next week, and we don't want that to happen, right? So I'm gonna strip them. That one we're leaving, got this one. If these sunflowers for any reason had turned out to be short, which sometimes happens with day length, there are a whole lot of different reasons, um, then I would cut them and then strip them. You know, I'm not, I don't bend over for much of anything. These are really bug eaten. Um, they really have some serious Japanese beetle damage. Uh, I just can't tell y'all how uh, unusual this is for us. Um, I know a lot of people are reporting a lot of different types of heavy pest damage. And um, for us here in southeastern Virginia, we had such a moist season last year. Then we had a really mild winter, which meant eggs survived. And I mean, it was just a, a, a perfect um, situation for them. Oh, this is a good one. Can't wait to show you. This is exactly when it should be cut. So I'll show you that one. This one is really, this one's really damaged. So sad to say he's history. And I will say that the white sunflowers, which um, the seed collection actually comes with the orange, um, they don't nearly sustain the bug pressure that the white ones do. This, is the perfect stage to cut a sunflower. Um, and that'll open quickly indoors, safe from beetles um, and safe from grasshoppers. I mean, it used to be our big pest was cucumber beetles, which we have our share of those this year too. Um, but this year, the Japanese beetles have taken everybody over. So now I'm just cutting these stalks and I mean, I'm cutting them right at ground level, getting rid of them. This will be a nice reprieve for anybody that's been being shaded by the sunflowers. And all this stuff I'm cutting off out in our big garden, I would just leave it in the pathways to break down. Um, you know, it's up to you. You can put it in your compost heap, whatever you want to do. Now I'm seeing how damaged this one is from the back of the beetles. So leaving this stuff in your garden is not helping anything. Um, so by cutting it and cutting it deep, like I just showed you with the zinnias and the basil, same cut for celosia, any branching annual. Um, go ahead and get the next stem growing, right? So get rid of those boogers. So I'm getting rid of this one. And y'all, I'm pretty heartless when it comes to cutting. But, so here's one that needed to be cut. This is a good one. We'll put this one in our 
in our little flower caddy here. So now I'm going to show you um, what we're going to do with these sunflowers. Yeah, I am. Um, I have every beetle known to mankind. You know that our snap beans. <laughs> I'm telling you, somebody could come here and do a study this year on Xenia diseases and pest pressure. I think our bean bee, our bush beans, have every beetle known to mankind. Um, all right, so here I have brought out a tray of a, some of my sunflowers that were started for our big commercial garden. And I am gonna just, let's do it over here. So this is where, these are those sunflowers I just cut out. Just cut them at ground level. And this is where we also planted those seeds. What was that, like three weeks ago? My internet just screamed. Um, so there's no sprouting happening here. So what I'm going to do is just take a new transplant. And I'm just going to find, there's a hole actually in our garden where there's nothing there. I don't know if somebody ate somebody there. So I'm just plugging in. Again, I'm doing about the same spacing, about every six inches. These, these, look at these sunflowers are perfect, y'all. These are, how old are these? These were started June 19th, what's today? So they're what, a week old? I mean, how much better is it to plant this than to put a seed in the ground and start praying? You know, that it, that it sprouts, that it survives. My fingers are gonna be sore tomorrow from doing this. You should have a little tool to do this as you get old, y'all. So, and I'm just plugging in, and what's gonna happen before you know it? You're gonna all of a sudden have more sunflowers to cut. And these are the orange ones. And, you know, some one of the things that we just talk about sunflowers all the time, y'all, because sunflowers are a huge crop for flower farmers. And it's one of the things you can really make a lot of money on if you have them available consistently for your commercial customers or for your markets. People love sunflowers, and we can thank Martha Stewart for that, y'all. Um, as annoying as she may be, she really made sunflowers the cheery, bright, wonderful thing that they are. So y'all, I'm just having to stop and look at what I'm doing over here. So there you go, in a heartbeat. We have a whole new patch of sunflowers. Um, so I am going to bring our little flower caddy back over here. I'm gonna put you back in the stand without turning you off. And Oh, I do want to walk back and give you guys the big view for those folks that are with us for the very first time. And so, and I'll just give you the little spiel. Um, I am Lisa Mason Ziegler. I am a commercial cut flower farmer here on the Gardener's Workshop Farm in southeastern Virginia. I've been doing it since 1998. And um, I've been around a little bit, do books, teach courses. Um, and I've taken what I do on a very grand scale here on my farm and put it into a three by 10 cutting garden. And it is how the home gardener um, can just have one to two nice handfuls of cut flowers each and every week from their garden once they plant the right varieties um, and cut them hard like we just saw, right? So now that the sunflowers, and I'll tell you, um, so in that, so the, let me just tell you a little bit, that building that you see there is called the Inn. Um, it was, it's a cottage, or it was a cottage. It's now used as a potting shed here on my farm. It's been on the cover of two books. It's been in mag, Country Garden magazines and other magazines. Um, and it's just the sweetest building ever. 
Um, and there's just great stories of people that stayed in here during the war when they were coming here to work in the shipyard and just lots of great history here on this family homestead that we live in. And um, <clears throat> this little three by 10 cutting garden is like the perfect garden. Actually, this garden was developed to go in front of this inn for Country Garden Magazines about 10 years ago. And now that we've cut those sunflowers out of the way, so if this was your only cutting garden, you would have those sunflowers to be an absolutely gorgeous bouquet this week, right? But look how it opens up for the sun and the air for all, with all the other stuff that was growing around it. And so now you're gonna see this other stuff just really take off. And um, I just can't tell you how incredibly awesome it is. And um, that little flower caddy of flowers is just too dadgum sweet. And um, so I'm just gonna sit down here and we'll, I'll look at your questions. And trying to sit down without sitting on a bee. All right, here we are, folks. So, um, just for those just joining us, this is the little seed collection of the garden we just saw. It's got a diagram on the back. It's got six packs of seeds in it. It's got a little um, pat, um, instructions in here, how I advise you set your cutting garden up. Um, but just to revamp what we've done for the last, I think this is week seven or eight, you can go to my blog at thegardenersworkshop.com, go to the blog, go to Lisa Lives, and then look at the hashtag at the top that says Cutting Garden. Um, and you can click that in all of the weekly um, home cutting gardens were there. Sorry, I thought I heard a creature next to me. Um, so we started off with grass here. We built the beds, put cardboard down, put rocks around it to hold the cardboard, filled up the bed with old container. Y'all, I keep hearing something over here. I might just get up and move. Um, we filled it up. We took some of the old containers that were sitting around the farm that I knew were not gonna be um, planted this year and we dumped them into this bed and then we added extra peat moss or potting soil actually and about 50% compost along with organic fertilizer we use the crab and lobster which you can find on our website from Neptune's Harvest and we planted transplants and here we are we, put, we mulched it with compost I netted it and um, we're just waiting on the flowers now so you can find all of it at thegardenersworkshop.com, if I can turn this right. And when you place an order, you get one of our sweet little pins. And um, you can also find those CVBN pills that I told you about under supplies. Um, and that's what we put in all the water to help cut down the bacteria in the stems of all flowers. Sunflowers particularly, zinnias definitely. Um, some flowers don't require it as much as others, but it doesn't hurt any of them. So we just put it in all of our buckets and that way we know all of our flowers are bacteria free. All of these little steps removing enough foliage, cutting them at the right stage, putting them into clean buckets with the CVBN tablet, then putting them into fresh flower food. All those little steps add time, add vase life, and that's what you wanna do, right? So let's see what we got here. All right, so hey, everybody. We got a lot of folks on here. Lots of familiar faces. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Betsy. Yeah, the Heliopsis is doing really well and um I, I actually i had a free moment or actually i needed a little de decompression the other day and i deadheaded some of it um because we don't typically cut that you could but we don't hey everybody i watch you watch you as i'm no nursing your baby that's so sweet um, so we have lots of folks. We had our first beetle sighting, but we are having a huge problem with grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are right up there with beetles. Um, and 
our grasshoppers are really big and I hate to even say this but I haven't seen them yet this year I'm sure I'll see them tomorrow now um, but I, I clip them I use my clippers I mean they're big and you won't catch them you can't you can't dump them into the soapy water like you can the beetles but a lot of times I can just clip them in half and that may sound gruesome to some but those people haven't had the serious grasshopper damage that some of us have. They'll destroy a whole crop in just a day or so. So every one you eliminate helps. All right, let's see. Gave your name to one of my customers. Oh, thank you, Rita. Oh, Edna says grasshoppers are eating her sunflowers. Again, I just can't stress enough that especially with sunflowers, if you're having really pest pressure that's damaging them before you can get them cut, start cutting them earlier. See how early you can cut them and that they'll still open. I mean, it's better than having a damaged sunflower, right? Amy, any better any tips on getting better germination from soil block celosia on heat mat with cover? Um, may make sure it's good seed. I don't know where you got your seed from, um, and you aren't covering them with soil. When you say with cover, I'm assuming you mean like a dome or something. I don't use a dome, but I understand some people do. Um, we just sew them firmly on the surface, put them on about an 80 to 85 degree heat mat, or they do excellent in a germination chamber, which is just like a sauna at 85 degrees, and we get excellent germination. Um, so, sorry. Me eating the leaves completely with holes in my zinnias. Yeah, this is just is just this is just a bad year for all this stuff, y'all. It's like your induction to dealing with pests. Hi from Virginia Beach. Some insects eating zinnia leaves, but none seen. Yeah, um, if you you've got to find out what's damaging your stuff. We would never treat with it. We don't treat with anything anyway but you would never do any kind of treatment of any fashion until you know for sure what your pest is. Um, because that's just really bad, y'all. You don't wanna do that. All right, I have a ton of little black beetles too. Melissa, I would take a picture of them and send them to your local extension office and confirm what they are. Not, I mean like ladybugs are a beetle, right? They aren't bad. Y'all, the gnats are surrounding me. Um, so you don't want to kill, you, you have to identify what it is that you have before you do anything. Um, as I've recommended in the past, the best basic bug book is Good Bug, Bad Bug by Jessica Walliser. Um, you'll find it on, we don't sell it, you'll find it on bookstores everywhere. Um, super good book. And then there's lots of others. She wrote another book about attracting beneficials. Um, but I'm drawn to books that are simple and easy to use. I just want to know what it is and then what I should do about it, if anything, organically. Um, so you can go down a deep hole with bugs, but a great resource that a lot of people just don't use is your local extension office. And if they don't know what it is, they'll send it off to the university. So that's just a great resource. Paula says we have tiny ones on our hibiscus this year. I, yeah, you have to find out what it is. I've been circling three or four times a day and getting them off the zinnias and the hairy balls. Yeah, I totally agree. If I could, um, I would do that for sure. It makes a huge difference. I got my catalog and pen this week. Had to hide the pen from my husband. Oh, Libby, that's sweet. Thank you for telling. We love hearing y'all what we do that helps you or encourages you or that you like um, because just like everybody, we do a lot of hard work here and it just is good to hear what actually you want more of. I made pesto with some extra lemon basil last night. Oh, what a good idea, Jessica. We were just talking the other day um, at lunch here on the farm about them making pesto. So I'll have to remind, I have to talk to Bobo about that tomorrow. Bobo's a chef, y'all, too, as well as being, has worked here with me on the farm for about 10 or 12 years. Um, somebody's asking, where do you get the netting? We sell the netting. We sell the green and the white. Um, you can find them both on our website. I learn so much every time you come on, love it. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, thank you, Mary Beth. 
I learned so much watching your videos. Your tips are really wonderful. I've been cutting my zinnias wrong, but not anymore. You know, we all cut them wrong, Joanne, because it does not seem natural to cut them that deep, but you will be so rewarded as the season goes on. You get so many great, strong stems. I've been smashing Japanese beetles a lot this year. You know, I mean, we've just never had them like this. And so I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do tonight. Actually, I'm gonna do it when I get off here, which I gotta get off here in a minute. We, um, a, somebody that I used to talk to him a lot, um, Howard Garrett, he's called The Dirt Doctor. He's written like literally about 30 books. Um, and I heard him tell an audience one time to, when you have, See, Japanese beetle traps attract Japanese beetles. So if you don't have a lot of Japanese beetles, you don't want to do that because you'll call all the Japanese beetles from a mile away to come to your garden. Well, we have so many now, I can't imagine that we would get more. Anyway, he told what he would do for Japanese beetles instead of traps. Um, you won't find this on the internet anywhere, I think because he's a... He has a lot of sponsors. He doesn't talk about this much because there's really nothing to buy. Five-gallon bucket, halfway full with really heavy with dishwashing soap so they get coated. Put a, I'm going to put a ladder with the bucket underneath, and then you just hang a drop light right over top of the bucket. And at night, the Japanese beetles are attracted to the light, and they fall in the bucket and drown y'all. And he talks about that you will have like a five gallon bucket full of Japanese beetles in the morning. So we have so many of them. I'm gonna put one over on the other side of my building where our zinnias are. I mean, what have I got to lose at this point? Um, I'm gonna try it and I'll try to video what we put doing it and putting it up and what we find in the morning. So that ought to be pretty exciting. Thank you so much for all your wonderful videos. You learn something each time, oh, that's nice. My first planting of pro-cut sunflowers had the lower part of the stem turn brown and break off. A few lower leaves turn brown as well. So far, the subsequent plantings look okay. Any idea what happened to the first ones or how or if I can prevent it in successions? Um, a lot of disease going on this year, Amy, and so I would definitely... Um, watch for it don't plant sun another round of sunflowers in that same spot you know be sure and rotate and um watch for it again and, and if you do have it again the best thing to do when stuff like that happens is to take pictures to document it and again send it to your extension office um, and just say these are my sunflowers do can you identify what this is they may ask you for a sample of the stem because they'll send it off to the university y'all this is our tax paid our tax dollars at work um, there are wonderful master gardeners usually there waiting for questions <laughs> and there's nothing they'd love more than to help a flower person so let's see we think our ducks have gotten rid of our beetles only seen a few they come in the garden and eat the grubs you know if i didn't have a golden retriever that i feel sure would eat the duck i would have ducks i'd have chickens maybe but we don't have a dog that would be um <laughs> the ducks wouldn't last very long I have cucumber beetles, flea beetles, Japanese beetles, all the beetles. Cutting the suns really early does help. Um, I think people are really frightened to cut flowers at the proper time and earlier um, because they're afraid they're cutting it too early. What have you got to lose when you got bugs eating it? So push the envelope, y'all. If the bugs have already sta started at the center of the sunflower, would you still cut that for a bouquet and sell? No. If you already have damage, it's only going to get worse. The flower, sometimes there's larvae on the, in there that are going to hatch out. Um, and so, no, you would never, for your own personal use, sure. But for selling it, no. Cut it and take it in your house and watch it. That is the best remedy, y'all. And I understand that you might have another 100 or 200 sitting out there with that same problem. But what's worse than not selling that 200 stems is selling them and having... Um, 50 upset customers next week. So, speaking from experience, um, if you are suspicious, there's usually a reason, and you need to figure it out before you sell them. My celosia keeps flowering so short, so I went and cut them all down to a couple inches. Hopefully, they'll get bigger. Let me tell you something, Gina. Um, our Solo Sunday celosia which is a really expensive seed and we grow a lot of it. 
we started it, then we couldn't plant on time this spring because it was cold, 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 wet, wet, wet. We planted them when they were about this tall and they were all blooming. They looked horrible. I told Bobo, I can't believe I'm telling you to plant these, but we're not throwing them away because it was like 480 plants. We planted them and I want you to know that just today I was taking a video. They're over 30 inches tall and each one of them has like 15 branching stems. I never cut them. They just branched around. Um, so there is hope. They will get bigger, I think. So y'all just keep, you have to be patient. Great idea, pinching or cutting off the first bud leads to a bigger plant with more blooms. Um, can the orange sunflower bloom more than once? No, these are single stem sunflowers. The reason we cut, we grow these instead of branching sunflowers, they simply are better cut flowers. They last longer, they have stiffer necks. There's a whole bunch, and I talk about that in one of our past um, videos, but we only grow the single stem for cut flowers. All the pro cuts, you'll find all the seeds and a lot of new colors, as well as the new, it's called the sunflower bouquet mix, which is um, three or four different orange pro cut sunflowers that we've mixed because some of them bloom upright, some of them bloom this way, some of them are a little deeper in color, they're really gorgeous. So they'll be a good one. Mark, if I have a sunflower variety that have multiple blooms, what is the best way to harvest? Okay, so if it is, Mark, a branching sunflower where it actually has long stems, I mean, we cut them when they are tight closed, petals showing, but tight closed, and you would make the cut all the way at the end of the stem. Um, and if you cut the central stem, just like we did those, the zinnias and the basil, cut below the bottom hmm, five or six side shoots, you will get longer and more branching stems, but you really have to cut branching sunflowers even earlier than single stem because they just don't last as long. They drop petals quicker. Um, they just aren't a good commercial cut, but for the home garden, they're awesome. Should all zinnias that are fully open be cut now? Yes. Zinnias, um, you don't want them to be going downhill. You want to cut them just as they're reaching their peak. And then once you cut them, they open no more. They do not develop like a sunflower does. Um, Y'all, it's really important. One of the things that's in vegetable, my book, Vegetables Love Flowers, it's not about vegetables, y'all. It's about flowers and how they benefit vegetables. It's all about a cutting garden. And it tells you the stages to cut and has my organic practices. It has the Japanese beetle thing in it and a lot of other stuff. You really have to know what stage you're supposed to cut in so that you get the best quality and the longest lasting flower. Everything is blooming short. We haven't had rain in almost a month. Well, Gina, for sure you have to water, um, you know, deeply once or twice a week, um, depending on your soil, if it's sandy more often, but not for so long. Um, but water will give you stem length, that is for sure. After the initial deep cup, where do you subsequent cuts made in zinnias. Good question, Lindsay. You go to the end of the stem. So you know where we cut and you could see where all those stems connect with that base stem. Um, I typically go almost to the base, but I'll be honest, once they really start branching, there are so many of them, you don't have to worry about stem length. I mean, I just cut it as long as I need. Um, so in the beginning though, I would go all the way to the base of that stem you're cutting so that you get more stems to sprout from there. After watching you all week, I'm definitely signing up in October for your January class. Um, so Sarah, thank you so much. Um, my course, Flower Farm and School, I had to stop and think. Flower Farm and School online, the basics, annual crops, marketing and more. Actually, my class runs in November. The, the sign-up will be in October. And if you can follow the link, I put the link on this Facebook feed just to our store on our website. If you go to our website and go to my page for that course, and it says notify me, sign up to be notified, and you'll get um, special emails from me, but we won't let you miss notification um, of when registration opens. But the registration will be open October 1st through 5th, and then that's it until next year in um, October. So glad you're going to join us, Sarah. You won't be sorry. 
how do you suggest netting plants? Um, Alexis, if you go to my blog, and actually I don't even know if it's on there yet. I actually put the netting on in one of our home cutting gardens. This week, all of the weeks that are missing should be caught up on our blog. Um, by next week, you should be able to go in and look. But also, if you go to our website, go to the product, um, go to supplies and go to floral support netting. There are videos right on the product that show you how to put it on. Oh, you're welcome, Melanie. Your flowers on each side of your end are so pretty. I think it's Rebecca. Can I, can I still start that in zone 8B? No, those are, they do look like Rebecca's, but they're actually a perennial called Heliopsis. Heliopsis. Um, and you would start, that is, we don't sell that seed. I did start that from seed, but you would start the seed in about a month to get it big enough in the fall to plant it, and then it would winter over and bloom next year for you. Hi, Colleen, thank you so much. I love watching your videos. Thank you so much, Joyce, you're welcome. We have flea beetles like crazy this year. It's our first year flower farm. Well, let me tell you about flea beetles. Flea beetles are different. Um, we actually, because eggplant is something we don't grow anymore because they are such a um, flea beetle magnets but we would cover our plants with row cover from the moment we plant the transplants and they're covered. Um, and we only uncover them when they needed to be pollinated, but for a flower crop, once they get big enough that they're like pushing the row cover off, you take the row cover off. Then oftentimes the flea beetle um, surge may have passed, but two, they don't do enough damage to be significant before you can cut your crop. Um, so floating row cover will save you big time. We use that often. I've had a lot of leaf miner issues along with the cucumber beetles. I have become quite the bug squasher as well. No mercy here. Thanks for your, you're welcome. Has anyone had mildew on their sunflower stems? Does it affect they like day? So that's the, oh my gosh, the Milky Way farms. Milky Way is my favorite candy bar. Um, Sunflowers do get um, downy powdery mildew, and they actually, we act, the seed that we sell actually is the mildew resistant version, um, and you can get that, the Pro Cuts, um, and it is a problem. Be sure and do not plant again in that same spot, um, and your, what'll happen is your stems will start crushing and getting ooky, and they just melt down big time. Um, and again, you should be using the chlorine tablets with sunflowers for sure. I really have to get off here, y'all, but I'll say this. When you go to the CVB tablets, it talks about, there's a group of flowers called the Dirty Dozen. And those are flowers that really need the tablets because they pollute the water and they have predispositions to problems with bacteria. Sunflowers, zinnias, marigolds, celosias, all of those are on the dirty dozen list. Um, and that really helps to combat when you have low grade disease, that'll help your flowers last in a vase um, when they otherwise would succumb. Our leaf sheffers are taking over, but I can't spray. It would hurt the bees. Um, there is nothing that we would ever have that would make me spray. So Carol, good for you. Um, I don't know that spraying, what, you're, what particular insect you're talking about, but we um, just deal with the pest and do the best we can and hope to um, eliminate and get the population down. We would never, ever, ever spray. Do you follow recommended spacing guidelines, my sunflowers? Nope, Lauren, you need to, um, check out, you can, there's a couple of things. You can watch the previous Facebook Lives. On the directions for this cutting garden, it also includes the spacing. The diagram on the back gives you the cut flower spacing. I talk about it in Vegetables Love Flowers. You plant much closer together when you're cutting, planting for cuts. Oh, Christy, garden mama, there you go. Oh, you're welcome. Um, So everybody's just commenting on how they're gonna cut their zinnias differently. I pinch my sunflowers, will that be okay in place of the deep cut? You can, if you pinch them early on, you just eliminate that first bloom and you delay blooming because you don't get that first bloom. So it's just a personal choice. Um, Lisa, I don't know where you live, but our sweet peas are done over and burnt up and cooked. They are really cool season stuff. We don't pinch sweet peas. Um, so, 
you'll have to use your judgment um, about that. Leslie's asking, what is a drop light? You know, a, um, like what the kind of light somebody would use when they're working on a car. It's a light with an extension cord that has a hook that you can hang it. Um, that's what I'm doing for my beetles, and I gotta go do that. My daughters love to pick Japanese bees and drown them in soapy water. We keep jars out by the garden for beetle picking. Exactly. Um, you better not let me talk to them because I used to pay a nickel a beetle, and they could get rich quick this year. Oh, thank you, Erin. Says she loves the book. I took your course, and it was a game changer. Money well spent. Thank you so much. Um, can you start, still start Rebecca in 8B? No, it's too late. I mean, you can start it, but it's not going to typically bloom. It's not the right time, and you should just wait and plant it in fall. And um, one of the things that's going to be happening, so once I get one more cut here showing you guys how to do this, I'm changing my weekly Facebook Live topic. We're going right into cool flowers, and um, we'll talk about that. But no, I would wait, Christy. Chiggers are bad this year, too. I forgot the bug spray, and I'm so itchy. Oh, we don't have chiggers here, I'm happy to say. Um, so, gang, I have to get off here and go make my Japanese beetle trap. And um, glad you guys joined me. The best thing you can do for me is to like and share this and invite your friends to join us next time and to like our page, The Gardener's Workshop Farm. And um, check out, I'm really, if, if you haven't signed up for our email, newsletter. I'm doing a great, um, I think it'll go out on Thursday. I'm not sure if it goes out Tuesday or Thursday. We send two a week typically for the month of July. And I am talking about how this is the proper time to use silage tarps and how I'm going to show a video of how I have my tarp down, getting my beds ready, or the place that I'm going to build beds for cool flowers in the fall. Now is the time and it's going to have a special discount code to get your silage tarp so you need to sign up for our newsletter you can do that on the home page of our website um, and we'll send you an email and um, get you going because let me tell you something y'all silage tarps are the bomb for creating a new garden killing a bunch of weeds that you've let and get out of control it's just really a great thing to do so thank you all so much and until we meet again ciao